If we just hung out here in silence for a second, yeah, we're both still breathing. Whew. It has a lot of names. Hypoxic drive, respiration, breathing. Needless to say, you know what it is. It's this. <sighs> but have you ever thought about it? I mean, not in the way you're thinking about your breathing right now. Ha! Deal with that. But have you ever thought about how your body does this? <sighs> when you're asleep, when you're distracted, or even really focused. No matter what you are doing, for the most part, your body is breathing for you. That drive to breathe is really strong. The reason you can do it without thinking is because your brainstem is doing all the work and making all the decisions. But we'll come back to that in a second. Breathing is a really complex balance of pulling oxygen in from the environment and getting carbon dioxide out of your blood. Even though we need oxygen to survive, the main influencer of the drive to breathe isn't oxygen, but carbon dioxide, or really CO2, or actually CO2's tendency to dissolve into water. Out in the world, carbon dioxide binds with H2O to create carbonic acid. It's why a glass of water left overnight tastes funny. It's got CO2 in it. The more CO2 there is in your blood, the more acidic it is. Brains don't like blood that's too acidic or too basic, so it needs to monitor this constantly, which is why, spread throughout all this, are chemoreceptors, central chemoreceptors in your brain, peripheral chemoreceptors in the body's blood vessels. These receptors sense subtle shifts in the levels of carbon dioxide and the acidity of your blood, and they send that info to the respiratory centers back up in your brainstem, actually the medulla. Based on the acidity readings from those chemoreceptors, your brain directs your lungs to make little adjustments in your rate of breathing to try and keep your CO2 levels as steady as possible, and this happens all the time. Now you're thinking about your breathing again, aren't you? <laughs> but here's the fun part. If you're, say, hypoventilating, hyper in medical context makes sense, it's fast. Hypo is the opposite, slow. So again, you're hypoventilating. When that happens, the CO2 levels in your blood go up and your brain wants to get rid of that. So it drives you to breathe more. That's called the hypercapnic drive to breathe, hypo, hyper. Thus, if you're hyperventilating, then your carbon dioxide levels are going down. That's called hypocapnia. The drive to breathe goes down as well. It all makes sense. And yet, we wouldn't be humans if we didn't see something working beautifully and say, hold my beer. The hypoxic drive is part of the autonomic nervous system. Pupil dilation, heartbeat, breathing, digestion, all that stuff. It's like the Morlocks of the civilization that is your body. Nerd reference. Anyway, sometimes people try to trick their brains and create a state of hypocapnia low CO2, remember, by hyperventilating on purpose. Who are those people? Free divers. To hold your breath for a really long time, some free divers will hyperventilate before ducking into the water. They can stay underwater longer this way, but, and there is a big B-U-T, this hypocapnic state can cause a phenomenon called ascent blackout, which is deadly. Basically, the hyperventilation makes you get rid of more carbon dioxide, making that drive to breathe slow down. But while underwater, you're not replacing O2 for obvious reasons. Remember, your brain isn't as driven by the need for O2 as it is driven by clearing CO2. So after a bit with low CO2 levels and decreasing O2 levels, the diver runs out of oxygen to burn and passes out. All without the brain ever triggering that sympathetic nervous system to kick in that drive to breathe. Instead, the diver has to surface and intentionally take a breath in time. This is extremely dangerous. Do not do it. Seriously, don't. This can even happen in shallow water, and it's called shallow water blackout, and people die. Of course, even though CO2 is the main driver, oxygen still matters. The brain does monitor oxygen levels constantly. If they drop really low, the body will kick in that drive to breathe again. But this matters more at high altitudes, where there's less air, which is a whole other thing. Look, bottom line here is when you're not thinking about breathing, your body is doing lots of things to keep you alive. Respiration is a base function of a living thing, so we're really good at doing this, even when we're distracted by our phones or driving or sleeping or whatever. The body is such a cool machine when you think about it, isn't it? We can't do Seeker episodes like this without our sponsors. Thanks to Gray's for sponsoring this episode. Gray's makes snacking exciting by combining wholesome ingredients with flavors we all love to create over 100 nutritionist-approved snacks. Go to Gray's.com and enter the promo code SEEKER to get a free sampler box delivered to your home or work. Your body doesn't just need to take in oxygen and put out CO2, we also need food. And if you're gonna eat, you may as well learn too. Our friends over at Thrillist just launched their new show, Food Groups. 
So there's an ingredient in Korean cuisine that means sort of like means home, right? It's called honmat, and the literal translation is hand taste. It's kind of the ingredient that makes home cooked Korean food that much more special. My buddy Dave is going to talk to food experts as they hunt down dishes that are authentically tied to different neighborhoods, nationalities, or lifestyles. Check out this episode if you love food and you love learning about humans and cultures and awesomeness. And are you still thinking about breathing? How many times did you think about it during this episode? Tell us down in the comments. And make sure you subscribe for more Seeker. Thanks for watching.